Let's stand together, please, reading God's Word, Psalm 51. I'll try to use, make good use of my time, Psalm 51. We'll not read all of it, but we will read down through verse number 14. We'll take a text. By the way, I think it'd be good, good to do this. Now, everybody's not back. Uh, next week, we, we still had some down the choir and orchestra, but next week we think everybody will be back. But right now, let's turn around. I want to, the main floor, turn around, look at the, I want to introduce you to the balcony. Could y'all turn around, look at the folks in the balcony? I want you to introduce, see, y'all wave at them. We have two churches here. Uh, actually, we have four churches. We have East Church, West Church, North Church, South Church. We actually have a lot, a lot of people here today, and I thought this, 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 this side over here, uh, well, look, this side looks really good too. So you all are doing a great job up there, and I appreciate that. All you, Mike Jones, you're in charge of all that side up there. If they go, if they go astray now, you're in charge of them. And I'm going to have to put Dwight Davenport in charge of that side right over there. Dwight, you think you can hold that fort right there? Now you all know who your captains are. And the main floor, we're just, we're just a mess. So we're just kind of, but uh, good to see a, a happy crowd today, a good crowd. Everybody be back next week. So come on in and fight for a seat. And uh, we're gonna have a great time. I'm looking at 2024. We've got some big plans. I want you to be a part of all of it. And we're gonna ask God to bless. Look at Psalm 51. David has been in the mess. I'll give you a little more background this week than I did last week. But uh, in my Bible, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. A uh, horrible thing. I won't go into all that mess. But, but here's what he said. <clears throat> the preacher had been in, and by inspiration, he writes this song. He says, have, Psalm, he has, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. How many are glad you got your transgressions knocked out? Amen. Jesus did that. Wash me throughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. One of the biggest things is this. We acknowledge that we're sinners to be saved so that Christ can save us. And after we're saved, we acknowledge when we sin. We keep that sin on short accounts. We talked about that last week. I, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, when God says you're a sinner, you're a sinner. He's justified in that. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. By the way, how many believe that life begins at conception? One well, of the proof texts of that. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear, the, the, hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out my, all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. We took a text last week from verse number 1. Let's take a text this week from verse number 12. I'd like for you to read with me verse 12 out loud in unison together. Verse 12, ready? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. I'm going to speak on that for just a while this morning. The results of restoration. We could say the results of revival. This man had a revival in his heart. He had a renewal. His life made a dramatic turnaround. And I want to talk about that for just a while today, the results of restoration. Father, bless now, please, your word. Help us as we work our way through this today. And may we leave this place clean. May we leave this place happy. May we leave this place saying, I want that starting place. I want to get this behind me. Whatever it is in our life that's holding us back from bringing glory to you, and teach us from thy word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I like to start my message in an unusual way. I like to kind of tell you a story as I see it in Scripture. I love the character of David. Um, 
I've said this before, I'll say it again, that, you know, when I read about David, you know, I think about all his adventures. I like to think of David on his mighty white steed, wielding his sword and just riding around as the mighty warrior king. And really, it wasn't like that at all. They, they, they didn't ride horses back then. <laughs> they cut their hamstrings, you know. They, God didn't want to, he didn't want the world to say, well, they won, they won their battles because they had mighty artillery and horses. No, they about ran everywhere they went. They used a sling, and if he rode on anything, he rode on a donkey, a kind, of, kind of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> hee-haw, hee yeah, Here comes David, woo You know, but I love to read about him because he was a mighty, he was a mighty, mighty man of God. And uh, as a young boy, David was a happy, fun-loving little lad. In fact, you may recall that when they, the prophet went to look for the king, he looked at all of his brothers first. They said, well, where's is there any more? He said, well, yeah, but David, he's out watching the sheep, you know. Well, go get him. And he was anointed. He was a little shepherd boy that frolicked across the hills watching his daddy's flocks. And at night, you can picture him laying awake, plucking, the, plucking out songs on his little harp. And uh, oh, how he would sing to Jesus with, with an uninhibited free spirit. Don't you just love to watch your kids do that? Boy, our, our grandson and our granddaughter, they just belt out some song, you know. And you ask little Blakely, she's two, she'll be three this month to sing one, and she'll sing Rocky Top, <laughs> which is a great hymn of the faith, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they just sing so uninhibited. You watch our kids when they sing here, you know. We as adults, sometimes we get kind of stoic. But just, just get us free spirit and rear back and let it rip. How about that when we sing? And... Uh, but that's how David was. As he grew, he became quite a man. He was not afraid to fight the lions and the bears. And he killed a lion, he killed a bear, but there were probably more than that that came through and wolves and different things and sought to destroy his father's herds. He became a man of character and integrity by hard work. He had a good daddy. He became a very spiritual man to the point that God called him, watch this now, a man after his own heart. He never says that about anybody else. The Bible says that he was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. Boy, did he know how to rejoice. I mean, there are times in the scriptures, at one time he came marching into town with the ark, <laughs> and they were singing and playing and sacrificing animals. And he was, <laughs> I mean, he was jumping around like an Alabama wild man. He was having a big time. God was in the camp. And so uh, he, he, he just knew how to praise God, knew how to rejoice. He knew how to do it in an appropriate fashion. Soon he became king over all Israel, this happy little boy. Everything he touched seemed to turn to gold early in his, in his reign. He had the blessings of God. He had the power of God. From the slaying of the giant Goliath to the destruction of the mighty armies, David found himself constantly rejoicing in victories, and a shout was in the camp. Oh, what a happy man he was. But something happened. Over a period of years, in the midst of David's joy and success, Israel had become a world power. And the king had pulled himself from the battles of life and was joining a life of leisure. He'd built his palace. And one hot night while reclining on his roof, I won't go into all of it, but he committed an awful sin with a lady named Bathsheba. If you read the whole story, God judges him and he feels like he needs to cover that thing up and he arranges to have her husband killed from that a little infant child dies it was a very dark time and the biggest tragedy is that David lost his joy the blessings began to flee he was once a happy godly man he became insecure he became depressed he closed himself off because heaven seemed to be closed unto him he got to where he couldn't sleep at night. He lost his smile. Nothing seemed to work out. He was grumpy. Becomes irritable, miserable. And he wishes, one time he writes, he wishes the day of his birth had never come. Nathan was his preacher. He was a prophet of God. He walks into his office one day there in the palace. He looks into the bloodshot eyes of a once happy man. And he said, what's become of you? 
And he tells a story about the little ewe lamb, and you can go back in the Bible and read all of it. And David got angry, and he said, I, I want to deal with that guy. I want, I want to take care, let's take care of that guy right now. And the prophet said, thou art the man. And the gig was up. God knew. The preacher knew. And he looked at me and said, what in the world's happened to you? You had it all. You had everything. The anointed of God. And you have blown it. David was in a mess. What was he going to do now? He could only do one thing. His heart was broken. So he confesses his sin. And he sought that forgiveness as we talked about last week in verse number one. Though he had to go through all the pain and torment that's, torment that's associated with sin, a wonderful thing takes place, and that is that God restores him to a place of joy and blessing. I thank God for Psalm 51. You don't have to go into the sordid sin that David went into, but it doesn't matter what sin that you've ever been involved in. Understand that if you'll pray for the mercy of God and ask him to forgive you, and you acknowledge your transgression as a sin against God, God will forgive that sin if you'll call him. How many of you thank God for that? Amen. Not just for salvation, but even as a Christian, if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And so here in Psalm 51, a wonderful change play, takes place. Now he's teaching sinners about the wickedness of their way. Now he's witnessing again. Now he's singing again. He's praising God again. And if you had known David during this dark time, and now you see his joy <coughs> and his excitement, then you'd, you'd say, well, what, hap what happened to you now? Why are you so happy now? Uh, I believe David would have answered like this. This is my opinion. I think he said, well, uh, I was a happy man one day. I was a powerful man, but I'd sinned against God. I lost my joy and I lost my power and I lost my blessings because of my pride. I thought, well, I'll hide it from everybody, <clears throat> but everybody but God. And may I say that you cannot hide nothing from God. You've got to get a lawyer man right there. Be sure your sin will find you out. I was miserable on the inside, he would say. I hated life. I was a hypocrite. I knew that. And God sent the preacher directly to me. He pointed out my sin. And whenever I saw that, I repented. And I got it right. I told God everything. I acknowledged my transgression. It's all right here in Psalm 51. <laughs> I knew that God desired truth down in the inward parts. And that's where life is lived for the Christian. In the spiritual, in the inner man. I knew that God wanted truth there. And I, I asked him to create in me a clean heart. I asked him to restore to me the joy of his salvation he gave me. By the way, it's thy salvation. God's the one that does the saving. He said, I, I want that back. I want the joy of that. He didn't lose his salvation. He lost the joy of all of it. And he probably would say this. Here's what you're seeing now on the outside. That's why I have a desire to witness again. And tell everybody how good God is. That's how... That's, that's, how, that's how come I can't wait to get back in the choir again and sing. I have a light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. He got the song back in his heart. You see, now I've got this hunger to see people converted and for backsliders to get right with God. You can call me fanatic, David would probably say. You can call me an extremist, whatever you want to call me, but you are looking at a happy man. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today, I promise you this. God didn't save you for the redundant life. He saved you for the abundant life. Now, I'm not saying if you get saved, that everything's going to be just perfect in life. It, it, it rarely is. I am saying that when you get saved, God's got something special for you, for all of us. And whenever we live our lives in sin and refuse to get that right and refuse to turn our lives around through pure repentance to God, then we languish in our Christian life. I want you to get 2024 off on a good foot with whatever that is that's causing you to not live for God full steam ahead. You get that confessed, you get that behind you, and you move forward for God. Now, let, let me just stop and say this. I... We need revival in America. We need revival in our homes. We need revival in our churches. And that is not going to happen until we face our sin like men and women of God. And David had to do that. He said, I acknowledge my transgression. 
Now, I don't know what it is in your life that you need to deal with, but I can say, say this. We need a reviving. We need a renewal. Now, uh, I want to give three quick things that should be noticed in your life about uh, this matter of restoration. Whenever God restores us and God revives us and we get everything right and we lay it on the altar and say, dear God, I'm going to live for you now. Whenever, whenever we get to that place in our life where God has restored us, there's at least three things we should notice. Now, there's more than that in the scriptures, but I want to be brief today. Would you write this first one down? First of all, number one, we should recognize a fresh love for lost souls. A fresh love for lost souls. <laughs> he said, <laughs> verse 13, then he said, verse, verse 12, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, we're talking about a time period. Once that happens, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I will tell you this, when your spiritual life is heated on all eight cylinders and you've got your sin on short accounts, you're going to have a burden one more time for the people around you that's lost and on their way to a devil's hell. Now understand this, our world is acting right now the way an unsaved world is supposed to act. We can complain, we can get mad, we can, uh, and all the news, the negative news that, that spews into our life every single day and say, well, why don't they do this? And why don't they do that? Or no one's ever going to do anything about this. Or no one's ever going to do anything about that. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that's just the way it is. You and I need to understand <coughs> that this world is reacting the way unsaved people react. We need to get a love for them. One more time. A love for our family members that need the Lord before the Lord comes back. A love for our neighbors that need to be witnessed to. A love for those around us that we, we that service us and maybe in a, in a store or whatever. A love for the world and missions. And I think about all the geopolitical upheaval now in our world in Russia and China and North Korea and Taiwan. And the list goes on and on and on. These people need the Lord. We're doing the best we can. A person, that, a person that is right with God will be involved in the mission and work of the church. Not just four missions. By the way, we set, a, we set a record this year as a church in our financial giving to four missions this year. And I'm just rejoicing. I can't wait to get in my next deacons meeting and begin to disperse some of that money to our missionaries. I'm excited about that. But ladies and gentlemen, not just <laughs> the world, world mission, but once we, we are, are right where we need to be, our sins are forgiven and God has restored us, we ought to have a, a burden for souls even around us at work in our community. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand that whenever a church is right with God, a church's witness will be right with the community they live in. We need to hit this thing with both feet this, this year. Telling folks about Christ and getting them under the sound of the gospel and doing all we can to see uh, young boys and young girls and men and women uh, born again one more time. A fresh love for lost souls. And we begin to pray for that and we pray for our invitations and we pray for people to be saved. And even maybe today, you need to put on your prayer list your loved ones that need the Lord, your family members that need the Lord. When was the last time you ever, you ever sat down and, say, and said, well, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is my brothers and, and, and sisters, his kid and his wife and, 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 and their kids or grandkids or my uncles and my aunts and my cousins. And you just made you a big old long list of all your family members. I, I doubt that only a handful of you could uh, have ever written down a list of all of your family members. Just in your immediate family. Let me challenge you to do that. And then start asking yourself a question. Uh, do they know the Lord? <coughs> Are they in church? Are they serving God? By the way, some of you may have trouble praying for any length of time. I would just tell you that if you just begin praying for your family, you'll, you'll find a way to, to, to sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. You'll find a way. I'm just saying, whenever you get your sins forgiven, that's for a reason. And David got his heart restored. And when he got his heart restored, the Bible says here, he said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach transgressors thy ways. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them, don't ever do what I did. And you need to clean your life up. And then it goes on to say, and sinners to, shall be converted unto thee. I'm just saying it's one of the signs of restoration. 
It's one of the signs of revival in church. Number two, write this down. Not just a fresh love for lost souls, but number two, a new song in their lips. A new song in their lips. Verse 14, really throughout this whole text, he's talking about singing again. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. <clears throat> Remember now he killed a man. Deliver me from, from, from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation. When you do that, he says this, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. My tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Do you understand when you and I pick up a hymn, or whenever we sing here, we're singing about the, our righteous God. How many of you thank God he's perfect, he's righteous in every way? <laughs> and understand, a church, a Christian that, is, that has got their heart right with God, that they have sensed the restoration of God in their life, they're going to sing a new song. Every great revival has always been accompanied by an interest in music and song. And the reason for that is that when you realize that you have been forgiven of that blood guiltiness in your life, God is the, and God is the one doing this saving uh, uh, in, in your life, then you'll start singing again and you'll pay attention to the words. Oh, how I wish our church would sing aloud the praises of Almighty God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says this, And be not drunk with wine, wherein in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is the picture of a Spirit-filled person. Folks, it, it is, the day is over for us just to kind of be looking up and down or around or wherever when we're singing. And we're all, we're, we're all can be guilty of this. But boy, let's just intentionally lift our hearts to God in song. When true confession occurs in the life of a backslidden Christian, God restores him. He cleans him up and he fills him with the power of God. Whenever that fullness of the Spirit is involved, it spills out on those around them. What is the result of restoration? Number one, a fresh love for souls. Our church will be the witnessing church it should be. And secondly, a new song in our lips. Number three, write this one down. <clears throat> what is the result of restoration? A fresh praise. A fresh praise. Look at verse 12. He says, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. The word free is speaking about a willing spirit. It's the Lord's spirit. We don't get in the service and do what we want to do, but we do as the Lord gives us freedom to do that. Look at verse number 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And so the idea here is not just the song on our heart, but when restoration comes, when revival comes, our rotten critical attitude goes out the door. I don't, I don't think that our media helps us with this. And I've, I've said this, and sometimes I feel like I repeat stuff, but, you know, when I was a kid, the news came on twice a day. <clears throat> In the morning, you got the corn cob report, <coughs> price of corn, cattle, beef cattle. And then you got some news. And then at nighttime... Do, 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 do. This is the evening report. No commentary. This and this and this and this and this happened. Although I, I understand how maybe how, how untruthful they were even back then. But now it's, it's, you can't get news. You got, you got a TV screen. You got six people there arguing. Looks like Hollywood Squares. And they're all mad, and they all got different opinions, and they actually literally bring in people with opinion. It's, we don't need opinion. <coughs> we just need the truth. Well, you can't get it, so just forget about that. I'm just saying. But you just get all riled up. I mean, I, I, I'm, I go down the road sometime, I turn my radio on, you know, and I'm listening to the news, and, and then I'm just thinking, this is just poison in my spirit. So I don't know that the media helps us with this at all. As a matter of fact, I know it doesn't, 
But what you and I need to do, we, we're living in a society that's critical, that's corrupt, it's negative, there's just nothing. Nothing seems to be going the right way unless your tomatoes are growing. Nothing seems to be going the right way. And kind of say, folks, you and I need to find a way to block that, block that out and learn to praise God because our sins are forgiven. One way we can do that is replace that with the fruits of the Spirit. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm almost done. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> and here's one thing we can do to kind of help with that. In Galatians chapter 5, we, we have a very, very uh, uh, important passage of Scripture that teaches us how we're to walk in this world. <clears throat> in Galatians chapter 5, we'll pick up reading in verse number 19 in your New Testament. I'm sorry about my coughing. I thought I had this taken care of. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, <clears throat> adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's unbridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. It's funny that he put witchcraft in there. We, have, we live in a very demonic poison society. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, that means quarrelsome. Emulations, he's talking about jealousies, wrath, strife, seditions, that means divisions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's what, that's what we're getting from the world. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, but, circle that word, but, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, means spiritual control. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the infections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now here we have what we should be replacing the criticalness of the world with, we should be replacing it with the fruits of the Spirit. He says in his prayer, take, take not the Holy Spirit from me. Now the idea that's an Old Testament idea. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would function. He could come on a person, come off a person, come on a person, come off. But whenever Christ came and died on the cross, the Holy Spirit came in to live forever. We're sealed the day of redemption. So God doesn't take the Holy Spirit from us in our in our. Uh, generation or our dispensation I could say but the Holy Spirit can go quiet in our life and what you and I need to do to live in this world we what we need to do is function uh, and not in the works of the flesh but in the works of the spirit we function in the works of the spirit crucify the flesh and we don't follow the affections the lust of the flesh <clears throat> then we walk in the spirit and so you and I need to understand that we can have a positive outlook in the midst of a, a dark time. We need to understand that we can have a, a, a fresh love for lost souls, a new song on our lips. We have this fresh spirit of praise. <clears throat> we can be the delightful person that God wants us to be if we've got that restoration. Old things are passed away, behold, all, all things become new. Why in the world would we languish in our old nature when we have a new nature. In 2024, I want to challenge you in this. I thought about whenever people encounter you, what do they get? They get person number one, what God wants you to be, or person number two, what you want to be, or person number three that's probably should be in jail. <laughs> what do they get? There should only be one that person that God wants you to be when you when you when you would encounter David <clears throat> would you get the the David before restoration would you get the David after restoration our joy should be full our power as a soul winner should be greater our faithfulness should be perfected our giving should be sacrificial our bitterness should all be gone Restoration, forgiveness should have taken place by now, and our fellowship should be sweeter because God's in control of our life. What are people saying about you? 
you probably wouldn't know. They'd probably say it behind your back. <coughs> but maybe something in your life has caused you to lose your joy and happiness that should naturally be there in the life of a Christian. You understand that whenever you got saved, the Spirit of God comes inside, and it's the Spirit of God that gives you love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It's there. And we all utilize all of that. Are people looking at a miserable person, a critical person? Are people looking at you and saying, good night, what's happened to you? What happened to that happy song that you had? What happened to that fulfilled life that you had? What happened to that? Or are they seeing a revived saint of God that's on fire for God, influencing those around them? And uh, you've got a song on your heart, a smile on your face. And then they would say, well, what's happened to you? Well, I got my life right with God. Let me just say, we need a church full of folks like that. I got it all fixed. How long are you going to go until you've got that? I look, I'm a pastor. I understand the ups and downs of life. I get it. I'm a human being as well. And I know how we can just kind of get off, you know, and have our own little pity party. And, and I know how, you know, we just start trying to get sympathy from other people. And I get all that. I understand all that. But, man, life is too short to run off of your agenda like that. Just make your own agenda and gather the people around you that's going to make you feel better about whatever it is you've done or doing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And when is it we're going to get off that merry-go-round and say, dear God, I'm done with this life. You saved me and I'm going to live for you. And I will make 2024, it doesn't matter what goes up, what goes down, or what kind of balloon they fly over our nation. I'm going to love God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think this is in our songbook. We're not singing it, but I love it. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home. How many of y'all know this song? Coming home, coming home. Open wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. You can find that one, can't you, Brother Pearson? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We're going to have him sing that in just a moment. He goes on to say, <clears throat> I'm tired of sin and strain. Lord, now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love Believe thy word, that Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart is sore. Now I'm coming home. My strength renew, my hope restore. Lord, I'm coming home. My only hope, my only plea, that Jesus died and died for me. Lord, I'm coming home. I need his cleansing blood, I know. Now I'm coming home. Oh, wash, wash me whiter than snow. Lord, I'm coming home. Now, folks, listen. I, I, I know you understand what I'm saying. I'm preaching to most people that you've had your sins forgiven and you've experienced the mercy of Almighty God. I'm so thankful for that. That's a starting place. Where are you at right now? God wants to take you right now, set your feet on a solid rock and put a new song in your mouth. And he wants you to help turn sinners to him.